we have one place that we call the S turn and there's probably on a good um, sunny day uh, you might see a hundred gators. Yeah. And winter is really the best time to see gators sunning because the water's cool and you might have a 65 degree day that they'll haul themselves up, you know, out onto the bank. Um, and there's some real stunners, you know, 10, 11 footers, some really big ones. That was Mark Benson describing just another day at the office, gators, golf, and fly fishing today on the wet fly swing fly fishing show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. In today's episode, I talk with Mark Benson, who breaks down shad fishing, a.k.a. the poor man's tarpon. Mark talks about the similarities between Shad and Steelhead, the St. John's River, and the $10 raw that's perfect for Shad. Don't miss this one as Mark describes what it's like to go alligator hunting. So, without further ado, here's Mark Benson from the Ritz-Carlton. How's it going, Mark? Great, Dave. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on. We're going to have a little conversation about Shad today and, um, you know, talk about how you got to where you are. I think you do a little bit of both some spin, some fly, a little bit of everything, but we can talk in, you know, talk about that. But um, maybe before we get digging deep to, to Shad fishing, you can talk about how you first got into fly fishing. Sure. Well, I uh, I was fortunate. I think like a lot of guys, uh, their dads um you know, probably got them started. And uh, same here. My dad uh, was a big sportsman. And uh, when I was uh, just a kid, three or four years old, uh, he uh, started taking me fishing, believe it or not, here in uh, central Florida, where I live. And I caught my first fish at four and then got my first fly rod when I was 10. (laughs) So between four and 10, uh, somewhere in there, I started reading a lot of magazines like uh, Field and Stream, Outdoor Life, uh, there weren't too many Florida-centered magazines, so a lot of the stuff that I was reading was coming from up north, and uh, there was always stuff about fly fishing. So I got really excited about that. It was something unique, something different, and it was something that my dad really wasn't into. So, of course, I had to had to be better than him and try something different. So I got my first fly rod when I was 10 and uh, took off from there. Wow. So, so that, okay. So basically I didn't realize you've been fly fishing since the, the very beginning, which will be cool to dig in, uh, dig into a little bit. I, I did, you just noted, um, you know, Florida, I guess, you know, this is a kind of a hot topic now just because the, the hurricanes kind of blasted through that area recently. It, did they kind of miss Florida for the most part? They did. We were very fortunate and, uh, my hats uh, off to the uh, meteorologists. They were calling, um, calling some great shots, fairly uh fairly far out as far as uh the broadcasting or forecasting so uh we were really fortunate the uh, hurricane did take a turn like they had predicted a few days out and it just skirted uh the coast we actually here in central florida had uh less wind and rain than we do for a normal summer thunderstorm oh wow so yeah we're very fortunate that's crazy, and and I don't uh, get into politics too often here. But uh, is it true that uh, the the hurricane was headed towards Alabama? <laughs> uh, you know, the, the initial reports, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It looked like it was going to cross through the peninsula, of Florida, and then go into the uh, the Gulf. No kidding. Uh, yeah, and then curve back. So wow. everything we were seeing eight or nine days out, um, you know, showed it going through Florida, and then it started moving slowly back towards the east, with it still coming through Orlando, and then. Um, as more data started coming in, uh, there was a, a slight cool front, I guess, or dry front that was pushing down. So it actually spared us and pushed it farther off coast. So, oh, wow. um, yeah, it could have easily come through the state and then turned and then gone back up to the Northeast. Have you had a few of those storms? Have you ever been involved in, in the middle of some of that over the years? I have. Yeah. yeah. You know, I grew up here, so, right, uh, you, you know, for it. quite a, I'm sorry. Oh no, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you've seen some, some big storms then. Yeah, we've been pretty fortunate. Uh, really, the biggest uh, year for us here in Central Florida was back in 2004 when we had Charlie, Francis, and Gene come through uh, within about six weeks, three hurricanes. So that was uh, uh, that was pretty tough. We were out of power for nine days here in Central Florida, which, wow. you know, compared to what people in uh, Mexico Beach up in the Panhandle and the Bahamas are going through, it's, you know, pretty insignificant. But, 
tell my wife that it was pretty hot. <laughs> That's right. No, I had a, um, we had a similar conversation. Uh, I had flip pallet on in a past episode and he talked about, I can't remember which, which I think it was hurricane Andrew he was describing, but how he was in the middle of it and, and held tight and the, the hurricane blew his house away while, while they were inside it and somehow they survived. It was a pretty amazing story. Yeah. You know, I know flip and Diane and what oh, they cool. went through back in 92 was, uh, was unbelievable down in the homestead area. Yeah. And, uh, that's when he pulled the plug and came up here to central Florida. Oh, that's right. Yeah. He said that. That's, yeah. That's cool. So it, it, uh, was the beginning of the end, end for him down in uh, South Florida. There you go. Well, that's, and I asked him that question. I said, so what, what, you know, have you ever thought about leaving Florida altogether? Is that something that you've, uh, you've ever thought about? Um, you know, it's funny you ask, I, uh, you know, I grew up here in central Florida and I've seen a lot of changes, uh, especially here in the central Florida, Orlando area. Um, so it's, it's really rapidly changing. You know, this was who I was and who I am. I, I grew up fishing and hunting and surfing and skiing. I'm looking out the window right now at the lake that I caught my first fish on. Uh, I was fortunate enough a few years back to be able to move on to the lake. Never had that opportunity before. Didn't grow up on the lake. And uh, I told my wife, if this house isn't enough to keep us here in Florida, I don't know what is. Um, you know, with uh, the water quality issues, some of the stuff right. that's happening over at the coast, uh, I'm sure your yep. listeners as well as you are, are well aware. Yep. Um, I didn't think in my lifetime I would see it turn this badly so quickly. And I grew up with uh, Lake Apopka, which I don't know if you are familiar with that no. lake. It's a uh, pretty large lake here just on the west side of uh of orlando that um was one of the top bass fishing lakes in the country back in the 50s and because of a big agricultural interest up on the north end of the lake uh pumping a lot of uh, phosphorus and nitrogen you know fertilizers as well as heavy metals pesticides back into the lake the lake crashed and uh, its final gasps were back in the 70s so you can't see six inches into the lake and it is uh, full of muck, hmm. and it's a nightmare. And you know, there's a lot of uh, attempts at, uh, at trying to mitigate that damage and, and um, restore it, but uh, hmm. we'll never see that in my lifetime. Right. And now, with the things that are happening in the Everglades, as well as coastal Florida and the Indian River Lagoon system, um, you know, people are looking for quick fixes. Uh, it doesn't seem like anybody's really that interested in fixing it. Mm, There's a, a lot of lip service, but yeah, um, it's it's difficult, right? And you know? so, how do you balance that and deal with that as a guide? As you see, do you just go to different areas, or how, how how do you stay in business there? Well, you know, I grew up fishing lakes, and then when I turned 16, I started fishing over at the coast, and then uh, got my captain's license about 25 years ago, and I was guiding over in the coast, uh, intercoastal. Uh, the Indian River Lagoon system, and I started to see more pressure. Um, you couldn't help but notice some water quality issues. In 2012, it really started to manifest itself in a really bad algae bloom, uh, but was uh, just seasonal. And then in the last couple of years, it's become pervasive. It's now pretty much brown or, or really dark colored water. And we lost about 80% of our seagrass beds. Hmm. So I kind of saw the writing on the wall, and uh, I moved my guiding interests inland. So I went actually to uh, – I've got a pretty unique situation. I'm the director of fly fishing for the Ritz-Carlton here in Orlando. Mm-hmm. So I'm now guiding on property. We have a 500-acre property with 11 lakes and ponds, and we manage it for trophy bass. Oh, wow. So you know, it's all catch and release. And we have feeders feeding our bait fish, so we have a real healthy forage population for our bass. So I've I've really moved away from the coast and uh, have come back to my freshwater roots here in Central Florida. No kidding. So so is that I mean is that kind of the answer that have some big, uh, powerful private in, uh, companies that are able to buy up and protect some of the waters around there? Is that is that a legitimate way to go forward? No, nah, I don't think so. I think no. you know this is pretty unique in yeah. what we have here. Um, I'm just moving back away from the coast, and um, there's still fish and fishing going on over there. It's just really difficult for someone like me who grew up seeing it at its very best. And now yeah. watching how bad it is. And the opportunities are still there. You can go through the motions. But what's really disconcerting, the people that have never seen it at its best 
think that what we have now is the new normal. Yeah. And right. they just have no clue. Yep. Not so it's, um, yeah, it's uh, pretty disappointing. And we've got lots of those issues. Uh, you know, we're the third largest state, our most populous state, uh, right after California and no Texas. Jeez. Yeah. So I think uh, I heard something just recently, like 600,000 people are moving to Florida every year. Yeah. And we have some huge infrastructure issues with wastewater treatment plants not keeping up oh, with uh, wastewater. And uh, there's through the power of the Internet, we hear more about these accidental dumpings, which really aren't accidental. Mm. There's no way that you turn a valve by accident no. and you dump raw untreated sewage Damn. into a beautiful lagoon system. But yep. It's not all gloom and doom. I mean, nature is pretty resilient. I think, you know, if we just stop kicking it while it's down, there's yeah. a chance that, you know, so she'll come. What what are the right now? What do you see as, as the, po- the the other end of that? What are the positives as far as the fisheries that you're involved with? Um, people are really starting to pay attention to catch and release. Uh, we've kind of got the uh, fishing games ear, especially down in southwest Florida, where they put a moratorium on keeping snook. Uh, trout and I think redfish as well. So it's uh, it's still reactive as far as how they manage, but uh, they're quicker to react. And uh, unfortunately, they're not reacting yet over here on the East Coast where we do most of uh, our saltwater fishing over in the Indian River Mosquito Lagoon system. Um, but the pressure, I think, has gone down dramatically as well. So mm. there's uh, you know, still quite a few people fishing, but it wasn't as, or it's not as crazy as it was back in the early 2000s. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Well, no, you, and you mentioned a few other species there, redfish, and we've uh, <laughs> talked about some of those on the podcast here. But today I was going to hopefully, you know, get into shad fishing, and that's one that I know you um, you focus on a bit. Can you maybe just start, talk about what your home water is where you catch shad and, and maybe just dig into a little bit how you, you know, how you get into them there? Sure. Well, we, uh, we're the most southern population of the American shad. And we have uh, uh, the St. John's River, which is about 300 miles long. It starts near the, the Melbourne area and then travels or flows north up to Jacksonville. And there's about a 35 or 40 mile section where the water is uh, very shallow uh, and uh, it's a narrow channel where you can uh, practically cast across it in most places. And that's where the American shad like to spawn. They want to have a current and they, uh, they move up into uh, our waters starting as early as November, but really it doesn't start taking off until January, February, which are the, the really two major months that uh, we focus on them. Um, they uh, are kind of an insignificant fish for most people here in, uh, in Florida. You know, everybody's looking at tarpon and, mm-hmm offshore species and stalking bonefish and things like that. But it's as close as you can be to a trout or steelhead fisherman without leaving the state. <laughs> a lot of the same techniques we do, uh, everything from single hand swinging to, uh, I've gotten into spay casting or switch, yep. uh, which is, uh, absolutely fun. <laughs> it's a joy. It's so much easier. Um, and it's just really a, a pleasure to do. That's, you know, I love that you mentioned the steelhead trout because that's a good chunk of the people that listen to this, you know, definitely have either steelhead fish or, you know, want to get into it eventually. So it's cool to hear that shad are, you know, the, the similarities there. And I, obviously the life history is similar uh, with their migration from the ocean. You know, can you talk a little bit about what else makes shad unique? I mean, and how big, how big do they get? What's the fight like? Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Well, we have uh, the smallest of the American shad. Uh, the world's record is a little over 11 pounds, and that was caught up out of the Delaware River. Our state record shad, American shad, is a little over five pounds. But we also have another shad as well, the hickory shad, which is predominantly found in the southeast of the United States. Uh, we do have the world's record hickory shad, which is kind of uh, interesting to to see where we have the biggest hickory, but yet we don't have the largest of the American. Hmm. And then we have a third fish, uh, blueback herring, which are really small. Uh, they come in as well. So all three species are anadromous. They all live in the ocean. 
for the majority of their lives. And then they run upstream when uh, conditions are right. And they come right here into our backyard. And, you know, I've, I've got to go back and, and say that I'm a fish guy. So I grew up fishing, but then uh, I started having aquariums when I was about eight years old. And I got my first job at SeaWorld when I was 15. And two years after getting my job at SeaWorld, I got a, a summer internship for the aquarium department where they ended up keeping me on because I could back up a trailer, I could scuba dive, I could catch fish. And I've always been a fish person, so I've really loved the whole story, not just catching them, but the mystery of you know where they come from, how they live. And the American shad, out of all the species we have here in Florida, is is really fascinating. The fact that they live in the ocean the majority of their lives and no one's really 100% sure where they go. And then they make the run up from uh, Jacksonville and they swim about 300 miles upstream right into uh, our backyard. So one day, one day they're avoiding sharks and a week later they're in the middle of alligators and cow (laughs) pasture. How long are they in the ocean for on average? So it takes typically about four years for them to reach maturity before they come back into uh, the river to spawn. So it's always fascinating to look back at the uh, records and see like 2010, we had a tremendous freeze here in Florida that uh, uh, actually killed bonefish all the way down to the Keys. But we lost um, all sorts of exotic fish, which we can talk about later that uh, I think uh, have an impact on the shad when they lay their eggs. So, it knocked back a lot of these exotics. And then four years later, we had in 2014, one of the best uh, shad runs uh, probably in the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. Okay. No and when you have a good shad run, what, what's it, what's a day like when you go out there? Do you, and do you typically start fish when the sun's off the water or does it matter? No, we're pretty unique. Uh, in most other places in the country, shad fishing is usually at low light. Uh, so uh, at dawn or at, um, um, at sunset. Uh, our fishing usually takes place more in the middle of the day. And the reason for that is our water is pretty, pretty tannic state. Yeah. So it's hard for them to really see in uh, super low light conditions, um, you know, the, mm-hmm. the flies that we're using or the lures. Mm-hmm. And, and what, uh, what's a typical fly? Can you describe a, a pattern or a name or something that we might fi- find out there? You know, they look like a kind of an anemic, uh, crazy Charlie. Mm. Really, uh, different colors, but uh, I think it's more profile than it is the actual color. I don't think that uh, color is paramount. Um, people used to think that uh, color changes would make a difference, but uh, what I'm seeing is over time, throughout the day, you know, there's pulses of fish that are swimming through different pools, and if the fishing slows down, I think it's more an indication that they're moving through and heading further upstream to spawn. Uh, and so it's not so much the fly that has changed uh, that you that you need to change to get more strikes. I think it's more of the fish just passing through. Mm, I see. Okay. And before we jump into some of the more of the tips on Chad, you, you mentioned SeaWorld. What what was that? Um, what did you learn from that position? Were you there quite a while? I was there 10 years and uh, it was a fantastic experience. I had a great time. This was back in the uh, in the 80s. And. We had, um, compared to the uh, aquarium uh, techniques today, it was pretty uh, pretty crude back then. But we had uh, some really terrific exhibits, and it really taught me a lot about uh, um, keeping fish, keeping, uh, um, you know, going out and collecting, things like that. It, it was a wonderful experience. Great people, and uh, I still stay in touch with a lot of those people who are around the world and some of them are pretty uh prominent marine biologists in other aquariums mm-hmm. nice and then and then from there you transitioned into the uh, the ritz carlton position no actually i uh, worked at a fish hatchery uh, for a couple of years and then i uh, worked for a large aquaculture and uh, lake aeration company for 14 years so mm-hmm. i've always kind of been a biologist uh with uh, my heart being in the fishing side of it Nice. Um, and, and now you're fully in on the fishing side. That's it. hundred yep. percent. Absolutely. Right on. Yep. Okay. So yeah, let's take us, I guess we're talking, uh, if we're looking at the St. John's for an example, can you just take us to the river and talk about how you get into fish and, and what a typical day is like there fishing for shad? 
Yeah, absolutely. So it, depending on the water level, and it's uh, really important to, uh, to follow how our levels are, the uh, river during the rainy season almost turns into a large lake. So it could be as mi- wide as two or three miles wide with hardly any flow whatsoever. And then as we start getting closer to, uh, to the winter, we start getting away from the rainy season and the river starts to recede. As it does, it uh, is pretty much squeegeeing uh, bait fish, shrimp. We have a freshwater shrimp called a paleomanides shrimp, and then small mosquito fish called gambusia. So they're up in these Spartina flats uh, that are miles wide. And as the river drops, all this food comes down into the channel. And when the river reaches a certain level, uh, about four and a half or five feet on uh, the USGS gauge, then we know that our conditions are perfect and we have the velocity for the actual spawning act as well as the velocity for keeping the eggs clean. So once the eggs are fertilized, they drop down to the bottom. And if you've ever seen an old washboard road, you know, Mm -hmm. like a sandy road, that's pretty much what the bottom of the St. John's River looks like in the area where they spawn. Yeah, it's a real hard sand, which, you know, Florida used to be a big sand dune or beach uh, as it started to recede from the ocean. So those eggs drop down to the bottom and they've got to have uh, a certain amount of flow to stay clean so they're not suffocated by detritus or, or muck or what have you. So those areas where there's a fast enough flow, that's where we target the fish. So I'll drop my boat in and I typically run upstream a few miles and then work my way back towards the ramp throughout the day. And what I'm looking for on a good year are uh, actually turns, birds feeding on the small bait fish and shrimp. And then I start looking for fish that are actively feeding, uh, coming up and going after those uh, bait fish, the gambusia and the, uh, and the shrimp. Uh, there's been a huge misconception, and it's been perpetuated for years, that uh, two things, that our American shad die immediately after spawning, and two, that they don't feed when they're in the river which is contrary to any other shad anywhere else in the, uh, in the country, both mm-hmm. East Coast as well as West Coast. So I think uh, people really don't seem to fully understand it because they only spend a few weeks out there right at the very middle or at the peak of the, the season for fishing. Uh, the river itself can be uh, pretty intimidating as far as getting around with braided channels and limited visibility sometimes with really high vegetation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, they pretty much go to the same spots, kind of where the X is, where all their buddies go, and they really don't spend a lot of time poking around the river. So I've got a pretty unique boat. I've always had uh, duck boats where we have those surface drive or long tail um, air-cooled motors, which uh, kind of the poor man's airboat mm-hmm. you know, allows us to really get around. So I spend a lot of time out there, and I, I try to figure out what's going on and what they're thinking. and you know, why it all works, you know, the way it does. What was the type of boat again? Uh, so there, we've referred to them as duck boats or mud boats. Mm-hmm. So these are large, like John boats with, uh, mud buddy motors or surface drive motors. So if you've ever seen the, um, alligator hunters on TV down in Louisiana, uh-huh. they have those big military looking, uh, uh, motors on the back of the boat that aren't oh, yeah. outboards. They're, they're uh, like big Briggs and Strattons or Hondas or Kohlers. Uh, so they're air-cooled, so they don't, uh, they don't require a water pump. And we can run through oh, some cool. pretty thick stuff and run across sandbars and things like that. So it really opens up a lot more water for me to get around. Gotcha. Whereas a, a conventional outboard would uh, bottom out. Right, Or the airboats, which are just way more expensive. Is that the deal? Uh, they, uh, you know, they're... Wonderful tools in the right hand, but uh, they're pretty noisy. Oh, they, noisy, uh, yeah. Yeah, they kind of break down a lot. There's, you know, and I'm probably going to catch flack for that, but uh, <laughs> they look I don't fun. think they have. They look, well, they look funny and they look cool at the same time. They're a lot of fun. I've got friends with them and um, I have been, actually Flip has been trying to get me to get one for years. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, Flip runs the river out there in his little grass boat, which is uh, unique in this area. It's more of an Everglades style boat. Oh. And yeah, he's been trying to get me to get one so we can run together. I just, uh, I'm just not ready to break down all the time. Yeah. So, so is alligator, I mean, are, are there still, have you ever been out alligator hunting? 
I have. As a matter of fact, season just opened. I did not apply this year. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, I've hunted in the past for them. They, uh, what, what's that like? I mean, can you take us to a, an alligator hunt real quickly? Yeah, it's uh, it's not anything like you uh, you see on TV, like in Louisiana. We're not allowed to shoot them with rifles. Uh, way too many people. You'd skip a bullet into somebody's house or All right. maybe a boat. But uh, uh, back in the old days, you could apply for a permit and uh, harvest fifteen alligators. Now it's down to two. So it's if you're a local or resident, it's a two hundred and fifty dollar quota permit and then two ten dollar tags that are uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. They're referred to as the CITES, C-I-T-E-S tags. So you get those, and then uh, you're limited to a specific geographic region, sometimes just a particular lake. And um, you can harpoon, Hmm. catch with a rod and reel. You can snag with a rod and reel. You can also uh, shoot them with a bow and arrow. Hmm. But eventually, everything ends up being harpooned so that you have a a strong attachment to them. Mm -hmm. And then you use a bang stick to to kill them. Right. And then you have a 300-pound dead lizard. I was going to say, is, is there a size limit, or is it uh, like do people go for only the big ones? Or yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I don't even know what the small size is. Uh, you, it might be four foot or something. I'm not yeah. even sure. No one, right. very few people, I think, would ever even settle for a four-footer. And is this, a tro- is this like a, a tr- kind of a people aren't really eating these things? This is more of a trophy mounted sort of thing? Yeah, people are eating them. It's uh, typically what you do though is you uh, you sell it to a processor, so they buy the skin as well as uh, the meat. So they give you a, a per foot price. Um, so you really don't get anything uh, uh-huh. if you if you do that unless you ask for the meat or buy back the meat. So you gotcha. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'd rather have a nice steak or lobster after a night of gator hunting. Yeah, yeah, than, exactly. Uh, <laughs> and a gator. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, let's uh, yeah, just get back to the uh, the shad here. So, so you were just talking about you know, I guess if we if we're on the river here and are, now are you fishing typical like you're out you're waiting and swinging these the flies down through runs like you would steelhead fishing? I see some guys waiting. I, I discourage that. There's a lot of alligators, even oh, though it's uh, yeah, even though it's primarily winter. There's a section of the river that we fish south of State Road 50. And if you look on a map or Google Earth, uh, you look for Orlando and then you look for the Cape, Cape Kennedy. And about two-thirds of the way from Orlando over to uh, the coast, there's a river, and that's the St. John's. And on State Road 50 south, no gator hunting is allowed. And uh, there are a lot of airboat tours that uh, take tourists out to see the gators. It's yeah. very impressive. He's, even as a Floridian that grew up here, there are a tremendous amount of gators in that section. Uh, never had any problems with them. Uh, they're pretty much more scared of us than we are of them. Yep. But you don't want to stumble across one. So we, we typically fish from the bank uh, or we, uh, we fish from the boats. Mm-hmm. And I've got a G3. It's a large 18-foot John boat that I've had the front deck extended. And the river is slow enough in flow that – we can anchor from the stern, which you wouldn't want to do anywhere else um, in case something happened and you took a transom, you know, water over the transom. Oh, right. But uh, we can cast off the front, and uh, uh, it's as seriously as close as you can get to steelhead fishing. Hmm. Um, it, uh, you know, it's quarter cast across the current, keep the rod tip down, and then let it swing, and hopefully you're dragging it in front of noses of fish that are uh, – uh, stacked up maybe in a seam or just in a, uh, a wide area where there's a lot of current. Hmm. Uh, sometimes, and the water depth can go from anywhere between three and a half or four feet to maybe six feet. Yeah. So it's fairly shallow. Uh, and then plenty of times those fish come right up to the surface as well. So you'll have uh, those small gambusia, the little minnow looking things, um, up on the surface, maybe in a, a little seam where you have two currents coming together or something that's draining off of a, a big pasture or field or slough. So you have uh, kind of a holding area for that bait fish and the shad will come up and whack them and they are eating, you know, I've, yeah. one of the biologists here in central Florida, um, uh, really great guy from FWC has conceded that uh, they are finally feeding or that they're recognizing that they're feeding. And he thinks that they're doing that just to go back or put the protein back into egg production. Mm-hmm. So the fish are here for a while. They, uh, they don't do one batch spawn. They'll do, uh, 
multiple batches and they want to kind of spread all their eggs out over a period of a couple of weeks just to ensure that uh, you know they they're getting some uh, reproduction or, or uh, recruitment right with, okay uh, and they're coming so you're you're targeting them be, as they're kind of stacking staging up before just before they spawn yeah so they're they're spawning in the evenings so we'll go out um, 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock or whatever noon and then um it's the nicest time of year to be out on the river. You know, we've got uh, about eight months of incredibly hot, muggy temperatures, and then we have four months of just stunning beauty. And that's really about the only time I like being out in the St. John's. Uh, no mosquitoes, low humidity, and you can fish all day in the evening, and mm-hmm. uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. And there's hardly any, anybody out there. No that's the other nice thing. So yeah. There's not many people doing it. Uh, there are a couple of areas where it's easy for people to get to, so they all stack up there, and you can pretty much walk from boat to boat, um, or you have to wear a helmet because everybody's fly casting oh, yeah. and chunking jigs and things like that with conventional gear. Uh, but then if you go another half a mile, uh, they uh, they start to peter out pretty quickly because they don't they're not familiar with the water, oh, right. and they they don't feel like they need to run that far. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and, but you could travel many miles around and find your own spot up there. Absolutely. There's yeah. at, at perfect water level, there's probably uh, 20 miles of ideal um, uh, area to fish. Yep. So you, you have good flow um, uh, and plenty of bends. You know, most of our water that's fast enough to fish are typically coming out of a turn, so it's accelerated or the water volume has been compressed into a corner and then it comes out and just downstream from those bends, we have uh, pretty good velocity. Cool. And as you're going up uh, back to the alligators, are you guys seeing how many alligators might you see in a typical day going up? Well, we, we have one place that we call the S turn and there's probably on a good uh, sunny day, uh, you might see a hundred gators. Jeez. Yeah, and winter is really the best time to see gators sunning because the water's cool, and you yep. might have a sixty-five degree day that Jeez. they'll haul themselves up, you know, out onto the bank. Um, and there's some real stunners, you know, nice. ten, eleven footers, some really big ones. No kidding! Wow, that's really yeah. cool. Yeah, that's a whole other show just talking about the gators, right? Their their life history, and <laughs> I'm sure they. I, I would just guess that they're do, they're probably doing pretty well. Am I am I right with all these? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's been a success program here in Florida. And it's funny, you know, when I think about where you guys live up in Oregon, West coast, you know, I'm always asking about bears. So, yep. I just saw a few bears myself this, this weekend. That's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, same thing. Yeah. You're so used to it. And then, uh, I, you know, I live on a lake and I see them swim by the dock in the morning. So there you go. It's, uh, there you go. Not no, a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Bears are for sure. I, well, depending where you're at, obviously up in Alaska, there's some places where you'll see a heck of a lot, but, um, no, it's good. I, I definitely, um, love kind of digging into some of these little tangents, but, you know, I guess taking us back again, uh, you know, on the river with shad. So, so what is the, I mean, just the basic rod reel line setup? It, somebody would need to get going on this. And are, is it also something you could just do? I mean, if you knew somebody with a boat to go up there, is this something where you really need to get a guide? Um, well, it would definitely help, um, shorten kind of your, uh, your learning curve if you had somebody that could put you on the fish. But there are a couple of places, you know, if you do some searching on the internet, um, there's a, a, a small river called the Econolokhatchee River. It's an Indian name. We just call it the Econ that drains the eastern side of uh, Orlando. And that uh, flows into the St. John's River just upstream from a lake called Lake Harney. And at that confluence there, that's pretty much the, uh, the X. That's where everybody goes when the shad are in. It's uh, pretty easy to find, and it's less than maybe a half a mile upstream from, uh, from the bridge and the launch. So that's a pretty easy place to get to. Mm-hmm. But it's like working a tide at, a, uh, at an inlet. Uh, depending upon the water level, certain parts of the river fish better at certain water levels. So that may be really good for a couple of weeks, which most people, that's all they do is fish for a couple of weeks. And then they say that, you know, the run's over. But we'll catch them all the way into uh, late April, almost May. And most people think it's over by the end of February. 
Hmm. So yeah. having uh, having local knowledge and understanding. And last year we had a really terrible year. We had uh, extremely low water levels. Uh, the fish didn't draw themselves all the way up into uh, uh, the normal spawning areas. Uh, so I think four years from now or three years from this year, we're going to have um, uh, a weak year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I might be surprised, but sure. uh, uh, last year was was really disappointing. And that's that's tough to stomach. It's like, you know, you wait all year for this time to be, you know, a steelhead fisherman, yep. southern steelhead fisherman, <laughs> and then the conditions aren't there, and you, you know it's going to be a difficult year. Yeah. And you, what, what is that like? I mean, what what's a good day and what's a bad, bad day as far as kind of action fish numbers? Uh, 100 fish days are not an, uncommon when wow. they're really on. Yeah. And the key there, and I, I really want to stress this, it's easy to stay in one hole and just start wearing them out, but... You know, these are fish that are uh, that are coming here to spawn. They've already been stressed swimming upstream. Uh, they uh, they don't all die. I think uh, a fair amount uh, make it back down to the ocean, uh, like they do in other parts of the country. Even though I, I touched on it earlier, that most people have been led to believe that they all die. Um, and I I urge everybody to use fairly heavy tackle. Five weights are uh, are about as low or mm. as light as you want to get. Um, we've caught them on lighter rods just for the fight, but it really puts a lot of pressure on them, a lot of stress. They don't do well out of the water. Uh, it's a shad, you know, you look at them wrong sometimes and they die. (laughs) So using a net and then, um, fairly heavy tackle, they're not leader shy. Uh, you may have to go to a lighter leader just to get down deep. And we try not to use split shot or I don't even bother with sink tips because, Mm -hmm. Uh, the water really isn't moving that fast and it's not super deep with just lengthen the leader and, um, and then maybe use a little bit heavier fly. Okay. So, yeah. And and if you were, I guess in an area where there was some heavier current, say a different river, you probably, you do want to get down kind of close to the bottom for them. Yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, I go up to Delaware to, uh, actually to the Delaware river, Lambertville, New Jersey, and I fish with a friend of mine up there. He's a famous shad guide, but he's not a fly fisherman. He's uh, using what's normal up there, and that's um, heavy kind of uh, like downriggers or little oh, yeah. heavy planers to get down, yep. little spoons. Water's about 9 or 10 feet deep there. That's not the ideal place to, uh, to shad fish for them, but farther upstream, there's plenty of uh, fly fishermen going after them. And a lot of those guys are using sink tips or even sinking lines, it's a, a much bigger river, much heavier flow, and typically a lot deeper water. Yeah. Do you have any just kind of general tips for shad, you know, maybe either fish in there or just around the country that you might throw out there? For our shad, it's, uh, it's really paying attention to the water level, uh, making sure that uh, you have the current. If you're catching crappie or bluegill or bass, you're in the wrong spot. The shad are going to be in the, the faster moving water. So if you're, uh, if you're dredging the bottom and you're catching, uh, catching speck or warm mouth or whatever, uh, yeah. you're, you're not in the zone. Uh, keep your eyes peeled and don't discount the splashes that you see on the surface. A lot of people don't think or don't believe that they're feeding. And, you know, you could use a cane pole when it's really, really good. And uh, by the way, we call cane poles $10. Oh, yeah. Instead of ten cara, yeah, oh, ten, yeah we originated ten, ten yeah, because they only cost ten dollars. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you could use a cane pole and a short piece of line, and uh, pretty much just drop it in and and catch the shad right there next to uh, shore or by the boat. But mm-hmm. that's under just absolutely magical conditions. Right. Most of the time, you're going to have to be casting across the current and really treating it just like uh, like a steelhead. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you get, what's that, um, you know, that take, maybe you can take us to the moment when the fish takes and, and what you're looking for or feeling or, or all that. Well, with the rod tip down and it's swinging, uh, these fish are, um, a big one might be three pounds, three and a half pounds. So on a five weight rod, it's, uh, it's a pretty dramatic pull and then no hook set, you know, you lift, but you lift gently. They have a really paper thin mouth, mm. uh, pretty much like a crappie. And, uh, they're off to the races. They uh, have the other nickname uh, of being called poor man's tarpon. Right. So they do a lot of jumping, pretty exciting, and then uh, dig down with uh, turning sideways in the current with their body and giving you a lot of resistance. 
do you do you lose a lot of fish once you once you hook up uh not really no you know it's um if you've got your drag set and uh you don't horse them in you kind of you kind of know that you're in shad mode so you really don't put a lot of pressure on them mm. and um you know as long as uh, uh and also i highly recommend using a barbless hook i mean these are mm-hmm. not once in a lifetime fish like an atlantic salmon or something these are you know if you lose one you're going to cast again and, and get another one so it's much easier to unhook them without even uh touching them just reach down with uh, a d hooker or a pair of pliers and just pull the hook out gently <laughs> why do you think more people aren't into the, the shad fishing why do you think they still yeah uh there's still that mentality of they've got to keep fish i think um plus i think that uh, um you know they've, they've got too many other distractions we've got um uh, Tarpon fishing slows down in the winter, but we still have giant sea trout. Um, spawning bass are coming in. We also have uh, cobia along the beaches. So there's a lot of distractions. Mm-hmm. There's, uh, it's not just one fish at that particular time. You know, like being in Oregon and the steelhead move in. Yeah. There's plenty of other things. Uh, it's not a big fish, so I think some people kind of look at it like, uh, like it's a bait fish or something. Right. But, I think you'd really be surprised as well with the, especially the fly fishing community. They've really taken to it. And we have a wonderful fly shop here in, in central Florida in Orlando that, uh, caters to the shad fishermen and they, uh, they keep up with, you know, where they are and what's going on. So, uh, I think over the years, the more I talk about it and a lot of my friends, um, uh, I think it's, a uh, it's a nice, trout or steelhead kind of training fish to go oh, out yeah. and, and practice on. Yeah. That's, so, that's a good, a good point. I've had uh, a couple of people on mention that I think, um, uh, John McCloskey was on, he fishes up in Alaska and teaches, you know, kind of swing for trout spay and stuff like that. But he says he takes guys out in Georgia and he's a big, he's teaching people trout spay there. Just, he has guys that come in that are going on his trips up to Alaska and they'll swing into Georgia to do a little pre-trip, you know, learn the cast and stuff. I love it. Yeah. And then they'll go out there. It's kind of the same thing people could do in Florida, right? Prepare for their, yeah. their, their next trip, their big trip. Tarp, Absolutely. Yeah. And now with uh spay casting coming in um, and being a lot more popular and it's crazy to think that it's popular here in Florida, but there's a, a, a small core group of guys who, uh, um, every time they go out, uh, more and more people are interested in it. And, uh, I got into it a few years back and it is fantastic. I love it. It's so easy. Once you start doing that, uh, the other stuff is ridiculous. The single hand, yeah. it's just so much easier in the right conditions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you guys are doing it in, in the boat too. You're doing like two handed spay in the, in the boat. Yeah, we are. You know, the way that uh, I fish with my boat, with it pointed downstream and the huge deck, I can actually have two guys fishing off the bow of the boat at the same time, um, spay casting. So it's uh, it's really, really easy, really fun. And what are you, you're using, like a, a lighter setup, you're saying a kind of a switch, more of a light switch setup? Yeah, I'm, I'm using uh, a Loomis 5 weight and uh, uh, not a really heavy head. And just, it's funny, you know, talking snap tees and mm-hmm. Scandi and Skagit, it, it, we kind of play around with a little of everything. And then, then we get back to fishing and then stick with, um, you know, I think the snap tee is my favorite. I just mm-hmm. love that feel. Yep. And, uh, uh, so yeah, a pretty simple tackle, nothing, uh, we don't overthink it. You know, a lot of guys try to try to make it more than what it is. Uh, and I'm excited for them that they have a passion to try to do you know, a lot of different things, but, uh, it's, it's pretty simple stuff. Huh. How, how big are the flies like size wise and, and weight wise? Uh, like fours, um, and maybe even sixes. Mm-hmm. Um, so fairly good sized. Um, they're not super tiny. Uh, we've gone to really small ones to mimic more of the, uh, the smaller, um, bait fish and, uh, anything that has eyes on it. I think that's paramount. I think mm-hmm. they really, they see that and they see the, the, uh, um, kind of the contrast and the, uh, the profile in the water. Mm-hmm. Nice. So that, especially in that darker tannic stained water. Yeah. So, so you're just using a, so like a Scandi, just a simple Scandi line would be great. Cause you're not using a lot of weight. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then, uh, in, any other, um, you know, tips or temperature wise or anything else to think about? You mentioned, you know, obviously water level is a key. 
Um, anything else, any other important things to be thinking about? You know, really the time of year, water levels, uh, and, and speed, the velocity is the most important thing. What's the, is the velocity like a, a same thing, like a, a walking speed is, is what you're looking for? Yeah. Uh, walking or a little faster. A little faster. There's faster. some areas, yeah, where it, um, especially on a compressed turn, uh, you get a, a really good, um, uh, a good velocity around the corner. They, the faster it's going, the better it is. They just, they love to have that current. Do you use uh, two flies ever? Uh, I don't. Uh, I know some guys do. Uh, that's just a nightmare when you start yeah. hooking two fish and right. it just, you know, then you're trying to land it and it gets caught in the net and, uh, you know, or they're, they're pretty violent, uh, fighting even, you know, you bring them in pretty quickly. They, um, um, they may sling that hook right into you. We don't need that. <laughs> right. What are, are there any other uh, resources that you might mention for somebody that wants to dig in more to shad fishing and you know, either book magazine videos, anything? There's a great book called uh, the founding fish by John McPhee. Uh, it's been out for quite a few years and it talks about all the different fisheries around the country. Uh, it's a great, um, great read. There's some information in there that uh, we're starting to see, might be um, a little dated, not so much locations as much as uh, just some of the theories behind, um, like our fish here in Florida, uh, not eating, which they do eat, uh, and they don't all die afterwards. Mm -hmm. And you guys have shad out there mm -hmm. as well, don't you, in yeah. Oregon? Yeah, we do. Yeah, and I haven't really got It's been a long time since I've been been out for them they're um yeah it's same thing they they don't get you know obviously with all the other species you don't hear a lot about them it's almost like a, on the same level as carp you know you, you know they're out there but i think they are increasing in um popularity slowly as people realize they are pretty cool i mean all fish are cool you know that's that's the thing it's uh it's not about it's it's just about there's so many you can't do it all or it seems like you don't have enough time to do it all that's our problem here in florida you know with all the salt water and then uh, yeah kind of the focus back on bass for a lot of people oh yeah uh, is the salt water is the salt water um you know in florida i guess we were talking about flip and you think of the joe brooks days and stuff i mean is florida still do you have to go to the bahamas to really get into the good the good fishing no now we still got great fishing here as a matter okay. of fact after the hurricane that went through the keys more people were busy trying to uh get back to normalcy after the hurricane. So there wasn't a lot of pressure. So I've heard some great reports out of uh, the lower keys as far as uh, bone fishing. So uh, it's still there. And I think it's probably better than it was five years ago. Hmm. Nice. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. It's encouraging, isn't it? When everything else seems to be suffering from water quality issues. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we uh, before we get out of here, I just want to touch on the, the Ritz Carlton because it's it's interesting. You know, I hear about uh, I'm not sure about the history of that company, um, but yeah, the fly fishing. You're 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 the, one of their fly casting instructors. Can you talk about that position and and um, just tell me more about the the Ritz Carlton? Absolutely. So what's interesting about the Ritz Carlton is that there is a huge fly fishing tie-in to the Ritz name. Uh, Charles Ritz is the son of the founder, Caesar Ritz, of the Ritz-Carlton brand. And Charles wrote a great book called A Fly Fisher's Life. Uh, Mr. Ritz, Charles Ritz, passed away back in the 70s. And that book is just fantastic. He talks about a style of fly casting as well as uh, some leader tying. And then it's just a fascinating story. Here's a, a simple guy fishing with kings, queens, and presidents. Uh, and really wrote, like I said, just a wonderful book, but, um, for that area, fly, is that, the no, area? actually no. he's, uh, he was over in, uh, France and England. Oh, okay. So, and then he did a lot of fishing here in the United States as well. But, uh, uh, the, uh, position that I have as director of fly fishing, uh, we oversee, or I oversee, uh, the, uh, fishing as well as the, uh, casting instruction on, uh, on our property. We have, like I said, 11 lakes and ponds. The program started back in 2008. Uh, I came aboard four years ago, and we uh, were kind of the, the hidden gem on the property. Once people find us, we have uh, high drift boats that will go out and fish. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, uh, we have um, golf carts that we use 
driving around the property. <laughs> we have uh, some monster bass. Uh, our course record is 14 pounds. Jeez. <laughs> that and the course record being is this, a, is this like a course like a golf <laughs> like a golf course sort of thing? It is. So we have uh, an 18 hole Greg Norman designed golf course, and the water hazards are our fishing ponds. No way. Is that really? That's what it is. So. Yeah. So, you know, as a kid growing up in central Florida, I've been chased off of some of the best golf courses in the country, um, you know, at night sneaking in for bass. But here I am. I'm <laughs> encouraged to take people out and drive around and, and show them our property. Uh, we have amazing. one lake that's a mile long and 25 feet deep. And I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Wow. I, get to, uh, I get to do something I love in a place that I actually grew up fishing and hunting when I was a kid. Huh. And what's really unique is the west side of the property is bounded by a creek called Shingle Creek. And Shingle Creek is the official headwaters of the Florida Everglades. Oh, wow. So it starts right here in central Florida in Orlando and flows about 300 miles south through the Kissimmee River Valley. And it's supposed to go into Okeechobee and then flow through the Everglades. But that's another story. Hmm. Yeah. But uh, terrific fishing in the creek and uh, a lot of bass, bluegill, sunfish. That's our primary um, focus. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, back to this golf course. So I mean, what is that? You're out there to kind of dodging golf balls and stuff, trying to get out to your <laughs> How's that all that work? Uh, there's enough water that uh, when the golfers are out, we don't have to worry about the the golf balls. Uh, if you're a fly fisherman, I highly recommend going out in the drift boat so we can row around. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So, gotcha. um, I've had some close calls. Uh, it almost looks like a giant bass coming up when a guy drives a golf ball into the water off the tee box right next to you. So it is that, so you are out there fishing and there are guys, you can just watch people golfing and that whole thing. Sure can. That's absolutely. Cool. <laughs> that's awesome. So you get, hey, if you're a golfer and a fly fisherman, I mean, that's the place to go. Yeah, we call it fish and chips. So you can go fishing and then do some chip chipping around the greens or <laughs> or uh, uh, bass and birdies, whatever That's, you want to call it. That is really amazing. And do you get a lot of people? Is that is that the kind of the poll there? People are doing. Or is it kind of a? I mean, obviously, it's like a, a private course. Is that what people do there? They do both. Yeah, actually, it's open to the public, oh, is, so you right? don't have to be a guest at the resort. So we have um, both the JW Marriott as well as the Ritz Carlton Hotel on the property. Both are owned by Marriott, and we have a lot of locals that come in. Uh, they'll entertain, and it's not an all-day fishing experience by any means. You know, it's a couple of hours before a meeting or before you go to work. Um, they'll come out. Maybe they'll take a lesson before they take a trip somewhere. They want to tune up on uh, oh, yeah. on some distance casting. We'll get a lot of people in the summer who are heading up north or west for trout. Or they're heading over to the Bahamas and they want to they want to sharpen their uh, their fly casting skills. Or it's people that uh, are looking for something a little unique, a little different. We have, uh, like I said, some really big fish on property, and we've had quite a few people break their personal best records on the property. It's not shooting fish in a barrel; it's still fishing. Yeah, but uh, it's private, so. You don't have to worry about anybody else running in on top of you. And then we know where to go. We've got two other guides as well. And it's a lot of fun. We have uh -huh. a good time. And it's a nice amenity to the resort as well. That sounds, yeah, it sounds perfect. I think I might have to uh, utilize my Marriott card here to maybe do a trip out your way and get some, get some golf again, a little fly fishing. What else do you guys have there? What's, what's the Ritz? What's the whole experience, experience like? Uh, it's the, the largest Ritz Carlton in the collection. It's uh, beautiful. We're, uh, uh, halfway between Orlando International Airport and Disney. So you're minutes from the magic, but miles wow. from the madness. So there you go. So bring the kids out, get the kids there, stop by, do some fishing, some golfing. Absolutely. That's and then take the wife to the spa. Yep. You know, she can spend all your money there while you're out catching fish. There it is. There it is. All right. And, 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 well, and the, you have the alligators, which is amazing. You got that whole thing. We have them out there as well. Uh, you'll see more of them, of course, in the winter because they like to sun themselves. But uh, I've never had a problem with them uh, on the property. If there, there's any issues, we'll move them. Uh, it's it's not a sterile environment by any means, but uh, it's pretty well watched over. 
Yeah, this is great. Yeah, I might have to hit you up here here this a couple of years to do it, get get some sunshine when it's over here. It's freezing and raining and snowing and nasty. You know, come winter time over there, you guys are sitting pretty, right? Dave, I'd love to have you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny. It used to be I was envious of you guys six months out of the year up uh, yep. in the Northwest. Now it's almost ten months out of the year that I'm envious of you. That's true. It's nice. Our summers seem hotter and hotter. That's yeah. true. Yeah, it is getting uh, it's getting hotter here for sure, and le- probably less rain. Although we still get our our share of uh, you know twenty thirty days in a row of rain. That that's possible. So. Um, yeah. Well, let's, uh, you know, before we get out of here, just on the chat, anything else we want to talk about? I mean, we kind of kind of talked a little bit about the fishing. Anything as far as, I mean, flies, it's pretty straightforward. Any other patterns, anything to note here? It's really simple stuff. I think anybody that has ever steelhead fished, if they just downsize and uh, and think, you know, smaller fish, three and four pounders, I think they'd fit right in and, and have a great time. Uh, trout fishermen, if they're wet fly fishermen and they like to swing, uh, this is perfect for them. We've uh, we've had some years where we've skated flies on the surface, and they'll actually come up and go after that. Uh, that's more of a novelty than a real technique that's going to be useful all the time. Uh, but I think the most important thing I'd like to leave you with is we've uh, we've got some huge issues that are coming, uh, threats to our water quality. You know, it seems to be kind of the mantra around the uh, the country and around the world, from New Zealand with the dairy. Um, interest down there and the runoff to things happening out west in Alaska. Uh, We have uh, major water issues both coming and going out of a house. Uh, We have so many people moving here that finding drinking water is a huge problem and Mm -hmm. our state government has taken it upon itself to uh, start looking at the St. Johns River as being a source of water where they would draw water out and hold it in huge reservoirs and then pull water off of that. And then the other side of it is we have the waste that's going back into our water. So we have both biosolids that are highly concentrated human waste that they take from these wastewater treatment plants and spread them out on fields and agricultural areas that uh, aren't really absorbed by any plants or, or the soil. And it runs off into the ditches and uh, mm-hmm. creeks, and that eventually flows back into uh, into the uh, the river. So we've had, gosh, fish kills. Um, I think our population of shad is way down. Uh, I can't tell you exactly. I mean, anecdotally, I can I can recognize that it's not as good as it used to be. And then we have the threats from those uh, exotic fish that we have. Two in particular, both are non-native. Uh, one is an armored catfish, and the other Jeez. is a placostomus, which uh, placo or placostomus is an algae-eating fish that a lot of aquarists, freshwater aquarists, are familiar with, uh, except ours are 18 to 20 inches long, wow. and the ones in the aquariums are like three inches yeah. that you buy at the little pet shop. Jeez. So I think all of these are having an impact as well, eating eggs that are on the bottom, oh, yeah. and then we have... Um, uh, the possibility of surface water being drawn in during um, the, the shad run. So small fry that are on their way back down to the ocean might actually be drawn into screens. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I hate to think that this is the good old days right now, but, um, yep. you know, it's it's – kind of eye-opening to see what the threats are what, what would be if you gave one uh, you know somebody listening here one thing they could do to help or get involved or do something gosh there must be some local conservation groups that are probably fighting battling it a little bit no not at all oh really nothing yeah. nobody out there huh yeah. here's a scary thing you know shad are uh are not really uh a glamour fish they're kind of the canary in the coal mine if you're familiar with them if yep. you're not and you know most residents here you know they've lived here less than 10 years so that they, they have don't even know where the saint john's river is you know they're happy because it's warm it's beautiful you know it's a beautiful area but um slowly these things are being attacked and uh people just don't have a connection to it that's the really hard thing going out there and seeing how beautiful it is and then understanding what these fish are facing. And it's not just the fish. I mean, there's other things that are happening as well. We've got some huge issues with uh, uh, herbicides being sprayed around the state. 
um, in the waters to control or combat both water hyacinths, which is a non-native plant, as well as hydrilla. And it's affecting other things as well and, and washing down to the sea and creating issues there. It, I, I don't have an answer. I yeah. really don't know what to tell you. It's like, um, well, um, we'll, have to, just, we'll circle back maybe, you know, eventually a few years from now when somebody's listening to this episode, maybe, maybe there's, you know, some movement or change, or maybe somebody can leave a comment in the, you know, <laughs> somewhere to get the, the, the ball started. Cause it seems, it seems pretty amazing that, um, you could have all these issues and there's nobody doing anything. I mean, that, that sounds just crazy. Well, right now the focus is on our coast over on the East coast with uh, the Indian river lagoon system. And we're so fractionated here in Florida. You know, we have offshore fishermen who really don't care about inshore. Oh, all right. We have inshore guys who don't care about offshore. Yeah. We have so many new people, so much growth. Sure. Uh, it's hard, yeah, it's, it, hard. Yep. So you don't have it's a focus. difficult. You don't have a focus. Well, um, yeah, maybe we'll, before I let you get out of here, those are all obviously huge topics and, and very important. Um, I want to leave it on a, on a kind of a, a high note. Um, I've got a couple of random questions for you if you, if you have a few more minutes. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, and the first one is I'm in the process of, uh, putting the, putting together some uh, trading cards, kind of like the basketball, you know, uh, or baseball, you know, cards. If you, if you had your own trading card, what would be the highlight on that card? Wow. <laughs> and, I'll, um, and I'll give you a second to think about that. Cause I have another, another question for you. That's kind of a, a a, uh, another random one for you, but if somebody asked you uh, Beatles or Elvis, w- which one is your is your pick? Oh wow, Beatles for sure. There you go, for sure. Okay, good. Yeah, <laughs> that one's that one's always tough for me. Okay, and um, what about we were talking about gators and stuff? What, what's your you know your favorite food? If you had one meal, you had to go with um probably Mexican. Okay. And yeah. You guys have a pretty solid, uh, I guess down there, is it pretty diverse as far as your meal options? Oh yeah. We're yeah, uh, kind of the foodie. Uh, we're not, uh, we're not Atlanta. We're not San Francisco. We're New York, but, uh, we're catching up for sure. Yeah. And by the way, I love these questions. These are great. <laughs> yeah. well, these what do you are th- really good. What do you think of this training? This is a pretty funny thing because I'm actually thinking about maybe putting something together. If, if it's easy, a trading card. So every guest that's on the show, they'll have their own trading card. So eventually the Mark Benson uh, trading card might be out there. Is it, how, how's that sound? Wow. No pressure to come <laughs> up with some uh, signature statement here. Um, you know, I, it's funny. I, uh, I like to think my highlight is I'm a fun guy to hang out with and uh, I don't take myself too seriously mm-hmm. and uh, and I like to uh, live in the moment. I mean, I think that's yeah, that's the big thing. You know, we're all looking for what's happening, you know, ahead of us and too many of us, I think, look behind us. But I yeah. think living in the moment, uh, people ask me what my favorite fish is to fish for. If I'm fishing, it's the fish that's right in front of me at that moment. Exactly. If I'm not fishing, the easy thing to say is New Zealand. I love fishing for brown trout. But, you know, living here in Florida and really being a big fan of the shad, I I look forward to that time of year. It's a beautiful time of year. Um, And I've got friends who are world famous bill fishermen and, you know, giant offshore fishermen and and when the bluegill are on the beds or the shad are moving up the river, they can't leave me alone. I mean, they, they want to go shad fishing because it's, it's kind of like a dove hunt. It's more of a social thing. Uh, a couple of buddies out having a good time, seeing what works, what doesn't work. No pressure. And it's, like I said, a beautiful time to be on the river. Yeah, definitely. And I was just thinking as you were talking there about the kind of be in the moment, I, you know, a, another good resource or a good book is uh, A New Earth, you know, Eckhart Tolle, I guess is he's the, um, and that's what his, you know, the big thing talking about being part of the moment, not looking at the future, not looking at the past, but actually focusing on the moment right now, like right now, right here, right? We're not, I mean, I know I haven't been thinking about much else other than this conversation as we've been having it. And, uh, yeah, I guess if more people thought that way, maybe that would be, that would be helpful. I love it. And you know, it, what's funny is I read a book called illumination in the flatwoods. It's by, uh, a, uh, biologist named Joe Hutto. And he did, uh, something really unique. He had uh, a clutch of turkeys that imprinted on him. They, he actually raised them from eggs, wild turkeys. 
and he called it turkey time. There was no other place that those birds wanted to be than where they were at that very moment. There you go. And there's a great movie. And I, listen, I'm a turkey hunter. Oh, I yeah. love, oh, gosh, I don't really hunt much of anything else now, maybe some ducks, but uh, turkey hunting is it. That's yep. that's my thing. And uh absolutely love that. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No, going all over the place. No, here. no, I love it. I love a turkey. We, we've got some turkey hunting as well. Uh, well, maybe we'll, we'll save that one for the next one. And get into a little turkey hunting and some. I mean, gosh, we got into alligator hunting, so you can't, you, you know, you can't beat that. That's that's pretty much, you know, going out on a tangent. But um, but yeah, <laughs> Mark. Before I let you go, um, in the next six to twelve months, anything you want to note here? You got going either, you know, with you or the Ritz coming up here. Uh, I actually January eleventh, uh, twenty twenty. We're going to have our Outfitters Day where. Some of our professional partners, they come out, um, uh, Chittam Skiffs, uh, Sims, um, G. Loomis, Ross Reels. So we come out. It's a casual afternoon at the Ritz-Carlton from 12 to 5. It's a Saturday. Uh, we'll have a casting contest. We're going to throw uh, an 11 weight as far as we can. We've got some big guns coming out that uh, can launch the uh, the long rod pretty far, the, the big line. So uh, that'll, be, uh, that'll be coming up in okay. January. All right, it's perfect. a r- real casual afternoon. Just come out, hang out. Nice. You don't nice. have to. It's open admission, and there's no fee for parking. Cool. Sounds like a good deal. Sounds like your uh, your dog maybe woke up there with squeaking his his toy there. Did you hear that? That's uh, Thelma Lou. She's uh, four months old. Um, three days ago, my yellow lab. Yellow lab. Oh man. So she's just a little squishy pile of uh, fat and be- beauty, right? Well, actually, she is uh, all leg. She's American oh, okay. style. She's going to be my. Gosh, she's really going after that toy now. <laughs> um, she uh, she is a dynamo. So cool. a lot of fun, fun to play with. All right, Mark. Well, I'll let you. I'll let you get back to it. Um, if they want to find you, Mark Benson uh, Outdoors dot com is the best place. That's correct. And Dave, thanks again for the opportunity. Really enjoyed it. Oh yeah, yeah, I had fun. We'll, we'll keep in touch with you, and definitely, if I uh, get a chance to get some time here in the winter, I might swing down your way and say hi. Come down. We'll put you on a big bass. All right. Sounds good. I'll talk to you later. We'll see you. Have a good one. Thank you. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash Ritz. That's R-I-T-Z. I've added some local trips that might be a little closer to your home. One, two, three-day trips with guides you've heard from the show. Go to wetflyswing.com slash destination to find out more and to uh, get some details on upcoming trips. Um, just want to thank you for uh, sticking around and uh, uh, supporting the show uh, and stopping by today. I hope to maybe uh, see you uh, online or maybe catch one of these trips on the river. <laughs>